You're watching Hope City Church, one church in multiple locations. If you're engaging us for the first time, my name is Thomas, and I'm the online campus pastor. A little later, Pastor Ruben, our youth pastor, will let you know what happens around here. But for now, let me invite those of you who are new to start at hopecity.ca slash new. It is the best place on our website to start connecting with us, with others, and with Jesus. And if you're with us in person, you can also go to the guest lounge after the service, and that's just out in our lobby. Now, before we get into the service, let me ask you a very simple question. How did you get here? Like, what started the journey that led you to engage in church this morning? As studies show that nine out of 10 people who check out a church for the first time do so on the invite of a friend or someone that they trust. Interestingly enough, we know that six out of 10 of those friends you invite to check out church will actually say yes to your invite. At Hope City Church, our vision is to reach 1% of Edmonton. Our passion is to see Edmontonians who don't know Jesus come to know him because we believe following Jesus is the best decision anyone can make. Well, how do we do that? Well, statistics and experience tells us that it's actually through you. Who in your life do you think would be open to engaging church with you, whether that's in person or digitally this fall? They won't unless someone in their life they trust invites them and you have over a 50% chance that they would actually take you up on that invite. So who is that in your life? And here's what you can do. You can start by praying for them and then invite them to check out our church online. It's totally anonymous and they don't even have to leave their home to do it. Our vision at Hope City is to reach 1% of Edmonton and that starts with a one person in your life. So who is that person? Well, I'm so glad that you ended up here this morning, whether you're part of Hope City or new to us, enjoy the service. Well, good morning and welcome to church. Why don't you stand with us if you're here in the room and let's worship together this morning.
darkness lives in me For I was dead in sin But I woke up to see the light Continue to worship together this morning, the God who will not stop, everlasting, ever strong. Let's sing it together. Everlasting, ever strong. God, your love goes on and on. Time and again, we've known your kindness. Peace that lasts beyond the night. Hope that never Always the same, your love surrounds us. You're faithful in the fire, faithful in the flood. Your love keeps coming, it won't give up. Faithful in 
you know, as we continue to worship this morning, I just I wanted to read you something about who God is and about who Jesus is that really arrested me this week. It's from Colossians, it's in Colossians 1. And the heading here says, the supremacy of Christ. Starting at verse 15, it says this. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, or the thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, which are things on earth, or things in heaven by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. What a beautifully painted picture of who God is. So outside of us, yet so intertwined with us, sending his son Jesus to die so that you and I can have a relationship with God. And so this morning, as we continue to sing, I wanna challenge you to maybe get past some of the things going on in your own life as, as important as they are and as, as needed as that is at times. And to just say, God, I'm gonna worship you this morning because of who you are, because of what you've done in your holiness, in your set-apartness. I'm gonna choose to worship you this morning and bring you all the praise that you deserve. So let's do that as we sing.
morning we give you all the praise and all the glory that you deserve because of who you are and because of what you've done. We worship you and we love you. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining in with us this morning. You can have a seat. Hey, good morning, Hope City. My name is Ruben, and I get to be one of the youth pastors right here at Hope City Church. I'm so pumped that you took a piece of your weekend and spent it here with us. If you're engaging with our church for the very first time today, or you've been here for a while now, but sort of in the background, I'd like to encourage you to reach out and let us know you're here. We would love to meet you and help you get plugged in right here at Hope City. Now, there are two ways that you can really do that. One, you can head over to hopec.ca slash new, or if you're on site in person today, after the service, you can head over to the guest lounge, which is right beside our cafe, and our team would love to say hi. So I get to work with the next generation, and it's the best job ever. I get to tangibly see the now and next generation understand what God has in store for them. Friends, they are a generation that has so much potential, and I'm pumped to see those kids and teenagers come into their own and make such a huge impact for God's kingdom. Now, the fall is around the corner, so are a bunch of amazing opportunities to get your kids and students involved. It's an awesome opportunity for them to both learn about the goodness of God and also develop relationships with people their own age. So make sure to check out either hopecity.ca slash youth or hopecity.ca slash kids for more information. Today is an awesome day because it is our connecting point. The best way to plug in, encourage your faith, and grow in your walk with Christ is through community. I know for myself, I benefit from being in a small group because life can sometimes be a roller coaster and there are no successful Christian islands. Being in a community both encourages and inspires me in my journey with God. So after the service today, make sure to check out all the options available for you this fall. Check out the kiosks in the lobby if you're in person and to sign up for a group, head over to hopec.ca slash groups. So we say this often at our church, but it is so true. Prayer is the engine that drives our church. It's a truth that resonates in the heart of Hope City. So we see God move through our lives individually and our church through prayer and seeking Him out with all that we have. Throughout the year, we set aside one hour on a Saturday evening where we come together as a church to press in prayer and in worship, and they're called Engage Nights. Now I want to invite you to the next one. It's happening on Saturday, September 18th at 6 p.m. It'll be an amazing time to rejuvenate and inspire your soul once again in an incredible community. So put it on your calendars because we would love to see you there. Our church is absolutely blessed. We would not be able to do the ministries we are doing without you. So thank you, church, for partnering with us and for giving financially. When you partner with your church in a financial way, you don't just give to a building, but you give to so much more. You invest into a movement that's bigger than all of us through God's power. If you're already giving, we are so thankful for you. And if you're curious and interested in giving for the very first time, make sure to visit hopec.ca slash give to get all set up and going. Well, we have our lead pastor, Pastor Phil, preaching this morning with part two of our September series, Reboot. Enjoy the message. I got a confession to make. I really enjoy drinking coffee. Anyone else on that page with me? Maybe, maybe wave your hand or whatever. You know, this past summer, I purchased something that has moved me probably into the coffee snob category, all right? And it's this. It's a Nespresso machine. 
Now, if you own one, you know what I'm talking about. Like, the thing is awesome, seriously. My Keurig no longer cuts it anymore. And I, I actually didn't think a lot about getting this thing until I actually saw it at Costco one day. And I'm kind of a sucker for all things Costco. And so I picked it up. I decided to try it out. And it has ruined me for a lot of other coffees. Now, I want you to check this out. As I was writing this message, because I, I script most of my message, I was, I was typing in that intro into my message for today. I got an email from Amazon, and the email was this. Check this out. It was, hello, Phil Kniesel. Based on your recent activity, we thought you might be interested in Nespresso Starbucks coffee pods. And I'm like, what? So in case you're wondering, they are listening and they are tracking, all right? Like, that's just nuts, man. I'm like, wow, that was like five minutes later. But seriously, we all get it if you say to someone, hey, let's go for coffee. You know what we're saying? We're saying, hey, let's sit down and chat. Let's catch up. Let's connect. I have a good friend of mine. He lives in Saskatoon. And a few times a year, we make it a point to connect over coffee and lunch in Lloydminster. And I love those moments when we can do that. And something happens when, when you sit down over a coffee or over a meal. You build relationship. You connect. You share life. And it's in those moments where you just kind of feel like, I belong. Like, someone cares. Someone is listening. Someone has your back. And the truth is, we all want to belong somewhere. Any Jeep drivers out there? Uh, a couple of hands went up. Like, if you don't us or not, but Jeep drivers have a specific wave that they give each other when they pass each other on the road. And I don't own a Jeep, but I know if you hang onto the steering wheel and a Jeep comes by, you kind of do this. You just wave at them and you go down and you keep riding. But people on motorcycles do that all the time as well, right? It's a form of belonging, a form of community. And belonging mattered to Jesus a lot. Now, continuing our series on Reboot today, and it's a series about setting priorities, about making choices that matter most. And the word reboot means to restart or revive or give fresh impetus to. So really my heart through this series is that you restart your faith. You're revived in your relationship with Jesus, and, and you have fresh insight into priorities that matter most. You make eternal things important. Jesus said it this way, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. What does it look like to seek him first? You know, last week I said it's choosing the important over the urgent. And today I want to give you uh, another answer to that question by taking you to an incident that happened in the life of Jesus. Jesus was having dinner at someone's house, and someone else came and crashed the party. Now I want you to notice something and uh, realize something. Having dinner with people wasn't something out of the ordinary for Jesus. In fact, he did it lots. In the Gospels, those are the first four books of the New Testament. They're Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And Gospel just means good news. So in the good news books, there are at least 14 times where Jesus ate or had dinner with others. He placed a lot of importance on gathering and spending time with people, on belonging. There was the wedding feast at Cana, which um, there he performed his first miracle, which was turning water into wine. There was dinner at Matthew, the tax collector's house, and there he was accused of eating with sinners. There was dinner at the house of Martha and Mary. I talked about that last week. There were the miraculous moments of feeding the 5,000 and feeding the 4,000. And there was numerous occasions where he was eating at the house of a Pharisee, meaning a religious official. And I want to look at one of those encounters today. Jesus valued connecting over a meal or over coffee. In fact, it's in those encounters where we see miracles happen. We see lives changed. We see people understanding who Jesus was in a greater way. Ultimately, faith changed in those moments. And it wasn't in the temple where this happened. It wasn't necessarily on the Sabbath. It was when he invested into others and he found himself in community around a table. 
that's when the deepest, greatest, and most miraculous life change occurred. Friends, I want to tell you this. We weren't designed for isolation. We are created for connection. We are wired for connection. That's why biblical community and being around other Christ followers is so important. There's um, a book in the Old Testament. It's a wisdom book called Ecclesiastes, and it says this. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. What does he say? Two are better. Community is better than isolation. Why? Because we're meant to help each other out. And some of you, you need to figure this out because the last 18 months, every single one of us has seen the impact isolation has had. And I got to tell you, pastoring during this pandemic has been full of challenges. I've seen crippling isolation. I've seen people go through painful moments all by themselves. I've seen a family who wasn't allowed to be in the hospital right next to their loved one who was struggling. I've seen people experience loss and death while not being able to be next to someone they love in the last moments, and it's devastating. It's painful, and it's hard. Loneliness has increased during this time. Man, I'm even seeing long-time friendships end over somewhat silly and, can I even say, stupid things? I'm seeing families facing division and difficulties, and it shows me more than ever when our enemy gets a chance to steal, kill, and destroy, he will. But listen, Jesus came to give life and life to the full. And so I want us to go to an incident where he was having dinner at a certain Pharisee's house. It's recorded in Luke's gospel, and just so you know, Luke was someone who researched the life of Jesus And he wrote an account about it because he wanted to authenticate that Jesus was who he said he was. And so Luke writes this. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. That's not weird at all, right? When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Notice this. He thought to himself, Jesus answered him. In case you wonder, Jesus knows what you're thinking. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? It's not a trick question, Simon. So Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. Giving water for your feet was a custom they did there. As well as this next line, you would greet each other with a kiss. And Jesus says, you did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. As your great love has shown, but whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Okay, so there's a a lot going on there, all right? Simon, he was a Pharisee, meaning he's one of the religious leaders. Now, just so you know, that was the crowd who was continually trying to take Jesus down. And this Simon, the Pharisee, decides to have Jesus over for dinner. He invites him over. He probably wanted to see for himself, okay, is Jesus, like, legit or not? And so we read that he invited him to have dinner, and then we read this. Jesus went. Notice, Jesus accepted the invite. Jesus knew that over dinner, something extraordinary can happen. And Jesus knew that this was important. It was important to go. 
he readily engaged, and he, he put himself in a setting that might have been, and most likely was, a little bit uncomfortable. And I think that's a really great example for us. And then something Nuts, crazy happens. A woman crashes the dinner, but not just any woman, a sinful woman, a woman who had lived a sinful life. And most commentators agree she was someone involved in the sex trade. She literally would have been the last person on earth to ever be invited to Simon's house. Now, if you're like me, you're kind of reading through this and you're like, well, how'd she even get into the house? Right? Like, you can't just saunter in like, hey, man, that dinner looks good. I've showed up at your place. How did that happen? What I want you to understand is that a meal such as the one that Jesus was at was not private. In fact, people could come in and watch what went on and even listen to the conversation. This was just another way that the Pharisees continually showed others, hey, we're way more spiritual than you and we're way more better than you. Now, knowing that this woman would not have been welcomed at this house, what she did then took an immense amount of courage. And for some of you, I know you're newer to our orbit. Maybe it's your first Sunday. And just showing up to church takes courage. Some of you remember the first time you walked through our doors, whether it's here at one of our campuses, and and the amount of stress or the amount of fear that you were experiencing, but you took the courage to do so. And I want to say this, I'm so happy you're here at Hope City. I want to commend you for taking that next step. Others of you, it just took courage to take the step to decide to follow Jesus. And you're figuring out, how does this play out in my own life? Listen, anything worthwhile takes courage. And this courageous woman enters the house and creates this scene. And Jesus, he doesn't interrupt her. He doesn't tell her to stop. He lets her continue as she stands behind him weeping. And her tears were a lot because she was washing his feet with them, and then she was drying his feet with her hair. And then she breaks open this jar of perfume and pours it on him. Like this woman, she had a life of pain. This woman had experienced guilt and shame that was literally decades old. She had choices that she was embarrassed about. But at some point, she must have heard Jesus speaking about life and forgiveness and something inside of her changed, and now she just needed to see him. Her gratitude treats Jesus with the highest level of hospitality someone could show in that day. And in that moment, through her tears, it was like she was just letting go of all her pain. And some of you, you relate. You're living with massive pain right now. You may even have a lifetime of it. You're carrying burdens. You're carrying shame. You're carrying guilt. And I pray that you see the hope that exists in Jesus and you see the grace and the love that he gives. You can be redeemed at the feet of Jesus, friend. Because Jesus gives this woman grace. And some of you, you need to hear that. His grace is sufficient for you. His grace is there for you. But through this encounter, I want to illustrate something that might not be so obvious. I want to give you three compelling reasons why community is important. Why this should be a priority for us. And the first one is this. Community establishes care. This woman was filled with pain, right? And the truth is, whether you are facing it now or at some other point in the future, you will face pain in your life. We all will. And community brings others alongside of us who will walk and carry us through the pain. Because you know what we tend to do? In difficult times, we tend to lean towards isolation. But community is the thing that helps us, carries us, and brings the support we need. I was talking to Pastor Marlise just a few days ago. She's our small group's pastor. And, And she told me a story such as this is compounded over and over in many of our small groups. Right now, we have a family in our church where one of the family members is facing cancer, and their group has surrounded them. Their group cares for them, calls them, has been there for them, given them distractions from the fear and the pain. They bring the support this family needs in a time where it's been difficult. You need the right people in your life to share your pain so that you can heal together. 
And the woman shared her pain with Jesus. She cried and wept at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus was there for her. And hear me out. If you're going through some serious pain right now, I want to tell you, Jesus is there for you. He wants to bring healing. He wants to bring comfort. He stands with you in your pain. In the Bible, we read these words. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. And some of you, you're brokenhearted today. Some of you, you're totally crushed. Know that God is close to you. He is there. And one day, he's going to wipe away every tear from your eyes. One day, there's going to be no more pain, no more suffering, no more death. One day, we're going to experience the goodness of the Lord. And the reality is, until we reach that one day in heaven, pain exists. But friends, we don't have to hurt alone or in isolation. God desires for us to be in community with others so that we can walk together, so that we can help each other heal, so that we can carry each other's burdens. Dr. Henry Cloud says, we learn to love in relationships. When we receive love, this teaches us how to give love. But this costs us something. The woman displayed it. And I think a lot of us find this pretty tough. It costs us vulnerability. Like we need to put down our guard. We need to drop the facade. We need to be authentic because pretending we're okay when we're not, it doesn't help, right? And I think some of you, you might feel like, man, I'm not that great of a Christian if I admit that I'm hurting or if I'm struggling or struggling or even living with something. You get embarrassed. You feel that others are going to judge you. The greatest tactic of the enemy is to keep you quiet, keep you engrossed in your pain long enough to make you feel like it's bigger than it is, to make you feel more ashamed than you need to be. Paul, he was a New Testament writer, and he wrote a letter to Christians dealing with the same things, and he says this to them. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. We always think we are the exception. And friends, trust me, you are only dealing with what is common to everyone else. So be vulnerable and watch the healing. Watch the freedom that comes from that because it's in the dark where we suffer. And when things are brought to light, we can feel a sense of release. We can feel a sense of next. And it's then that those closest to us can help us and carry us and support us. So that's the first thing community does. It establishes care. Secondly, community changes our perspectives. Let's go back to the Pharisee's house. We have two main people besides Jesus. We have Simon and the sinful woman, right? And Simon is the perfect example of, hey man, I got it all together. I know the law. I follow the rules. I'm pretty much better than most people. I'm doing pretty good. And the woman, she's totally opposite. She's messed up. She recognizes her sin. She's filled with shame. She knows that she's outwardly broken and she expresses it. We have two very different people from two very different walks of life with two very different perspectives. And then there's Jesus in the middle of them, right? And what we see him display is that he came for both because both are sinners. And he changes their perspectives. He changes the way the Pharisee understands grace and forgiveness, and he changes the way the woman sees herself. You know, one of the many things I love about Hope City, about our church, is that we're such a diverse church. I look around, and I'm so thankful for every single one of you here week after week. And you know that the word diversity can mean to bring variety into something. And that's the beautiful thing about us. Our tribe, our church, whatever you call it, we are not all the same. We bring variety to the table. And you and I, we need people who are different. Not in following the ways of Jesus, but those that just think different and have different customs. Life is better when you bring people around you that are a little bit different than you. That live, look, and think differently than you. It gives you perspective. 
And at this time, in our society, where if you're different than me, you're a threat. If you don't agree with me, then you're against me. If you don't support me, then you must hate me. I want to say this, in the body of Christ, that cannot be true. As Christ followers, we are called to embrace each other, to be there for each other. Peter, a follower of Jesus, said it this way. I love this verse. Finally, all of you. So who? All of you. Anyone who wants to follow Jesus. All of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. That's how we're supposed to treat each other. In essence, he's saying difference doesn't have to equal division. Difference equals strength. And when you do life with others who are a little bit different than you, you gain perspective, you gain understanding, you gain sympathy and empathy. Your life becomes better. It happened with Simon the Pharisee. Jesus explained to him that this woman had been forgiven a lot, right? And in that moment, his perspective shifted. He went from, hey, if Jesus really knew he would, who was actually touching him, he would probably freak out a little bit, my words added, to, wow, Jesus really changed this woman's life in a dramatic way. He recognized how much she had been forgiven. Yeah, she was totally different than him, but she taught him a new perspective. And Hope City, hear me out, more than ever, a divided world needs a united church. A divided world needs a united church. We are meant to be united. We are meant to do life with each other. John, a follower of Jesus, said it this way. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. Okay, this, what's that this? If you love one another. So, community establishes care. Community changes our perspectives. And thirdly, community offers peace. There's something that happens when Christians gather together. We know that Jesus is among us because he says where two or three are gathered, gathered, there I am. And his presence brings peace. Check this out. The disciples, they were on the lake one day and they got caught in the storm. It was the Sea of Galilee. And in the middle of the storm, Jesus shows up You know what he says? He says, peace be still. And from that moment on, the storm calmed down. The presence of Jesus gives a peace like no other. It's a peace that surpasses understanding. Listen to how Jesus says it. He says, peace I leave you, or with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. See, the peace of Jesus takes trouble and fear away. And that's what happened with the sinful woman. She shared her pain, and Jesus looked at her, and what did he say to her? He said this, go in peace. Move forward without the tension of your pain. Move ahead into tomorrow knowing you are forgiven. You have a fresh start. In me there is hope. In me there is confidence. You no longer have to carry what you've been carrying. He gives her a new leg to stand on. No longer pain, but peace. You know, the world, they want you to worry. It wants you to fear. It wants you to doubt. It wants you to be living in constant stress and anxiety. And the enemy wants you to stay hidden, to stay isolated. He's convincing you, if you're going to open up, you're going to be judged. He wants to keep you in your pain. But when you're real, when you're authentic, when you're vulnerable in the context of godly relationships, when you take step towards true community, it's then in the storms of life that you can experience peace. Friend, you aren't defined by your pain. You are defended by your peace. You see, peace acts like a weapon against your mind, as a weapon against your soul and against your heart. It defends you from going down the road of damaging thoughts and patterns. You aren't defined by your pain. You are defended by your peace. And so maybe, maybe you're like Simon. Outwardly, you're someone who has it all together. You follow the rules. You know the scriptures. You're thinking, dude, I'm doing pretty good. Or maybe you're more like the sinful woman. You know you've messed up, and you know that you desperately need Jesus. No matter who you are, hey, friend, Jesus welcomes you. And no matter who you are, I want to let you know that Hope City Church welcomes you. 
Because at this church, we welcome both Pharisees and sinners because the truth is we're all broken. Some of us, we just tend to hide it better than others. But we all need the grace and the peace that only Jesus can bring. And no matter who you are, Jesus doesn't leave you where you are. He wants growth. He wants the next. He wants to experience life and life to the full. And he says part of that, friend, is embracing community. And I get it. For some of you, the next step of that just means, you know what? I think I need to attend church more regularly. I just need to prioritize that. For others, it's taking maybe the courageous step of joining a group. Community establishes care changes our perspectives, and brings peace. It's doing life with other people who want to do life with Jesus. And so this morning, I want to encourage you to take a very practical next step. Because today, across all our campuses, in our church, it's connecting point. And that means you can find a place where you can connect, where you can belong. We have over 60 groups that we're offering all across our city. And I want you to do life with others so that you too can experience the value-added community brings. I get this. Some of you, this is a courageous step. For some of you, you just got to really understand the value that this brings. Because here's the other side. You need someone and someone needs you. See, we have time for what we choose to have time for. There are priorities we need to prioritize in putting Jesus first. We can experience the fulfillment of community if we choose to step into community. And so, friend, let me tell you this. Don't hold back. Don't live in isolation. Discover what has catapulted the church for centuries. Be part of what the early church had embedded inside of their DNA, as Acts 2 tells us. Acts is a New Testament book. It says this, They, being the new believers, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, having a meal, and to prayer. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts, going to church, and they broke bread in their homes, having meals, and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Faith changed in those moments of community and drew people to Jesus. And isn't that what it's all about? I'm going to ask you to stand. I want to close in prayer this morning, please. First off, I want to pray. I know the very real thing that some of you are just walking through a painful moment in your life right now. And I want to pray for you that you experience the overwhelming, all-consuming peace of Jesus. And I want to pray for all of us that we see the need for community. Let's pray. God, you know that man or woman who's here this morning, and they're saying, I don't know if I can keep going. This is so hard. This is so painful. And I pray in the midst of their pain that they may understand, Jesus, that you are there, that you can surround them, that you can carry them, that you can guide them and direct them. I pray that in the midst of all that they're walking through, that they find a peace that passes understanding, a strength for today, a strength for tomorrow, a strength to carry on, a strength that just goes alongside of them, says, I love you, I'm here for you, I'm walking with you. God, I pray whether it's guilt, shame, remorse, whether it's circumstances, God, whatever it is, may they leave it at your feet. May they go forward knowing, Jesus, you are there. You can carry them and you can comfort them. And so I pray that over their minds and hearts today. I also pray for every single one of us that we understand the value of what it means to walk and do life with other Christians. God, how we can support each other and carry each other and walk with each other and really see the significance of what this brings to our lives. And so help us to understand this. Help us to prioritize this. Help us to live in this so that we can fully and completely understand the the joy of following you. And so I pray this over every person and every individual. You know, maybe you're joining us today and you don't know Jesus personally. And you're just saying, man, you're talking about this peace that surpasses understanding. And um, you want that. You can have that when you follow Jesus. And so he came, he died for you, 
He made everything right, and he rose so that he can offer you life now and forevermore. And if you want to make that decision, I want to pray a prayer alongside with you just to help you um, ascribe to that. So let's pray. Jesus says, I see my need for you today. I just say, I need that peace in my life. I made a bunch of decisions over decades or years where it hasn't gotten me anywhere. I'm ashamed. I need your strength and forgiveness. And so today I ask you to come into my life. I want to start afresh and anew. I want to understand the peace that you bring and the hope and the comfort and the guidance. And so I surrender my life to you fully and completely. And God, I thank you for every individual, for every couple, for every family that's represented here today. I pray wisdom, guidance, and strength upon them. I pray that you carry them into this week. I specifically want to pray for all our educators. Lord, may you just help them as they go into another school year of influencing minds and hearts. May you carry them. May you direct them. May you guide them. May you surround them in stressful situations, in in unknown circumstances. I pray that you just come alongside of them. And two, we pray over all our students young and old, as they go into another school year, we ask God that you protect their minds and their hearts in Christ Jesus. We ask that for every student that's represented of Hope City, that they are lights in their schools, wherever they find themselves. May you carry them, direct them, and lead them. And so God, blessing upon every individual and strength upon them as they go into this week. Thank you, and I pray this all in your powerful name, Jesus. Amen. You know, Amen. If you did pray that prayer where you surrendered your life to Christ, way to go. So proud of you. Can I ask you to go to hopecity.ca slash life? That's a landing strip, a website that has uh, numerous ways that you can take next steps in knowing what it means to follow Jesus. And we would love to hear from you. So please reach out and connect with us. One of our team, one of our pastors on staff would reach out to you and just really start this journey with you. I also want to say this. If, if you want prayer over anything, about anything, we're going to have a, cu- a couple pastors available down at the front right after the service. Just go down there. They'd love to pray with you. Well, Hope City, know this. You're loved, you're prayed for, and I'm cheering you on. I pray that you find yourself taking the step of community this week. God bless you guys. Have an incredible Sunday. Take care. What a great challenge, but also great truth about prioritizing community in our regular rhythm of life. We were never meant to do life alone. You need someone and someone needs you. So what does it look like for you or for your family? What difference could this make if you don't already prioritize engaging your church community? I want to remind you again that today is Connecting Point, a kickoff of all the ways you can connect with us, with others, and with Jesus. So don't wait. Engage the lobby if you're in person or go to hopecity.ca slash groups if you're engaging us online. The opportunity for life change is literally right in front of you. Well, that's the end of our service, Hope City. Thanks so much for being with us. Have a great week, and let's do this again next Sunday.